Well, thank you for inviting me. It's always kind of hard to follow Steve Jobs, so. <laughs> Although, I, I hope he would appreciate uh, talking about the magic of discovery, connecting the dots. He talked about, a little bit about it in his talk, and so that's what I want to talk about. And uh, so in the background, uh, as we get through the talk, I'll explain what this is about. But um, what is discovery? And you know, at one level, we've all experienced the magic of discovery. As a child, you know, you even see your toy sort of partially occluded in the dark, but you say, that's my toy, and you get that flash of recognition, that flash of insight, even as a baby. And then through your day-to-day -day life as you grow up, often in the most mundane things, you connect the dots, you, you figure things out. And then if we take it all the way up to the highest levels, you read periodically these luminaries burst on the scene like a Steve Jobs or an Einstein or a, a Darwin. The great story of Watson and Crick sort of figuring out the structure of DNA. So we've all seen that, but, and there's a magic to that, but it still seems a bit elusive and it almost seems like the big discoveries are there for the chosen few and the rest of us appreciate, absorb, and build upon that magic. So part of my talk here is how can we empower more people to experience that joy of insight with, with that magic that you get when you get that aha moment. Um, and uh, so that's really what I'm gonna talk about over the next few minutes. And uh, to start the dis uh, chat, what is discovery? I've put a lot of thought into that over my, you know, or, over my life. And uh, the best I can describe discovery is that it's uh, sort of a, it's a blend of loosely guided structure with the, cre the freedom to explore. It's that somehow, you know, it's that complex sort of mix. There's some loose guiding structure, but yet you want to go think out of the box. So a good way to start the discussion is uh, maybe look at music. And, um, if we look at some of the great composers of the past, they were very good at that. They, they were guided by loose structure, but then they innovated and they would find patterns uh, that were pleasing to the ear that they set to music. Uh, what you see here is actually a brilliant visualization of uh, Debussy's Claire de Lune. Uh, performed by Stephen Malinowski, who actually gave a talk on his uh, sort of musical animation in a TED talk in Zurich, Switzerland a couple of years ago. And he was kind enough to allow me to use his, uh, his visual. But there again, the composer created, had that flash of insight to create the, 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 the music. The musicians played and the audience listens. Now, there have been other musical forms where the musician, while playing, does, uh, within a loose structure, does explore. Indian music with ragas, jazz, and many other music forms have that interplay between structure and the freedom to innovate or improvise. So now you've got the composer, maybe with the loose structure, the musician who's innovating, the audience is still listening. So, how do we get, empower more people? How do we democratize discovery, but yet keep the magic? Can we transform the magic of discovery into a science of discovery? And that's what I want to spend the remaining part of my chat uh, conversation with you guys about. So to do that, what I want to do is to maybe fast forward to the present and switch gears from Debussy to interactive video games. Now, with interactive video games, people design the loose set of rules, and the players have a certain amount of freedom to innovate and explore within the game. Should I hang a left to avoid the, the, you know, the, gun, the, the guns or the monsters? Should I hang a right? And so you almost create your own game within the set of rules that are loosely defined in, 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 when you buy the product. But there again, the onus is totally on you as the individual. If I make a left, if I make a bad choice, you know, I go kaput. If I make the right choice, 
I win the game. So it's a little bit of you know, throwing darts. Now different people with different skill levels can somehow figure things out. But that still is, you haven't really taken the discovery or the insight and made it into a, a process where more people can experience that, that feeling of aha. It still depends on the individual skill of the person driving the show. So what I want to do is to now step, talk a little bit about maybe thinking ahead from where we are today and think, can we actually do something more to empower more people to make those discoveries, not necessarily the discoveries that are going to cure cancer or solve the, the big problems of the world, but in the context of their own lives, be able to connect dots that can help them live a better life, a more meaningful life, that makes sense for them. And, but before I, to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go back about a century before I jump back in time to the, to the present and the future. At the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, everyone would look up in the sky and ask, what's out there? What's between us and the moon? What's between us and the sun? And there was this fear when people said there's nothing, it's just a vacuum, there was a fear, a fear that nature abhors a vacuum, and that ca there can't be just nothing between us and the universe. So they invented something called ether, which was a made up virtual stuff that sort of filled all the voids uh, that uh, were between us and the stars. And there was a lot of effort for about 20 or 30 years to develop all sorts of complicated theories about how light sort of propagates through the ether, squeezes the ether out of the way and all that stuff, and then it, the whole thing kind of fizzled out. But maybe they weren't really you know, off, uh, off track. Because if you think about today, we are living in a sense in what I would call a data ether. There's data all around us. Everywhere we go, especially in the last you know, 10, 20 years, with all the mobile devices, the ways, different ways data is communicated to you through all your personal devices, so on and so forth. In sort of a fundamental sense, we've almost become transmitters and receivers of information surrounded by this data ether which the scientists of the 19th century would only have could only have imagined. So the interesting thing is how do we interact in this connected environment where there's this data around us, surrounding us, and we sort of selectively choose and pick what it is that we want to look at. So I just want to kind of leave you guys with maybe something to think, imagine a little bit. If you had, as we all do now, carry all these devices that know something about our interests, maybe, you know, I'm a, I'm a cancer researcher. Can analytics or something out there sort of assess the data ether surrounding us and suggest maybe there's a pattern of genes that you might want to look at. Or if you're an investment banker, hey, there's a pattern here in the financial markets that you might want to look at. If you're an engineer, maybe there's a certain pattern of sensors that might lead to uh, improved fuel efficiency. Uh, all sorts of things that match your interests to now have a proactive mechanism where the data ether is not just this passive blob out there, but is somehow proactively talking to you, suggesting ideas so that you can connect the dots. Because one of the things I've learned is that when people come to me and say, here's a blank piece of paper, create something, I'm clueless, I have no idea what to do. We get paralyzed. But if I propose something saying, hey, you know, these genes might actually be responsible for this type of cancer, people are very good in their fields of interest to look at, to look at that and assess and say, does that make sense? Or maybe, maybe it does make sense. Maybe I'll dig in a little deeper. And sometimes when you trigger, jumpstart that process, you do end up connecting the dots. So, if you're able to somehow take advantage of all this technology today, but 
combine that with the human spirit, which is that curiosity and the passion to want to discover, to, that, to experience that magic of discovery, can we systematize that process of two-way communication between the data ether around us and we as humans and as individuals with our own interests and skills and passions to be able to have that two-way conversation proactively to end up filling those blank sheets automatically, magically with ideas that can then trigger us to connect the dots to innovate, to experience, and maybe to, in, many, in a small way, improve your life and maybe the lives of others. So I just want to leave you with that, that story of how from the beginning when we were all just, most of the world was waiting for the next Einstein or waiting for the next Darwin and wondering how did they connect the dots? What was that flash of insight? How did they come up with their aha moment? Can we in today's world create a world where we democratize that and let more people experience the magic of discovery. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you.